In October 1962, Congress had passed the key file for Harris Drug Amendments to the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act of 1938. Now, before marketing a drug, firms now had to prove not only safety but also provide substantial evidence of effectiveness for the product's intended use. But does that mean prescription drugs in the modern days are less dangerous than in the past? Hi everyone. Welcome back this week. Now today, let's delve into why prescription drugs are one of the leading causes of death. The CDC website listed the three causes of death in 2021. Number one being heart disease. Number two, cancer. And three, COVID-19. But what did that look like before COVID-19? Now in 2014, a Denmark physician published an article claiming prescription drugs are the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer in the U.S. and Europe. What's more alarming was that half of those who died from prescription drugs took their drugs correctly as prescribed. Now, how could that be? Prescription drugs are meant to be safe and effective according to federal law, right? The article points to the root causes: impotent or incompetent drug regulations, corruption of scientific evidence, and lies in drug marketing. Now, of all the drugs that led to death, psychiatric drugs, specifically antidepressants, are singled out as a major contributor, mainly because these drugs carry a high risk of fall for elderly people. The FDA also strengthens the warning that non-aspirin, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen and naproxen can cause heart attacks and strokes. But beyond the specific drug properties that can directly cause excessive harm to the body, it would seem more of the problem originated from the system itself. A researcher from Queen's University in Canada termed the systemic loss of integrity and ability to provide the kinds of trusted knowledge epistemic corruption. Now, the Cochrane Review in 2017 conducted a meta-analysis of 75 studies encompassing over 8,000 trials. The findings suggest that when pharmaceutical companies fund medical research, the results of these studies tend to be biased in favor of sponsoring companies' interests. In simpler terms, it means that when drug companies pay for research, the result may be more likely to support their products, even though the studies are conducted with standard scientific methods. Now, this raises concerns about the objectivity of research funded by pharmaceutical companies, and highlights the need to consider funding sources as a potential factor influencing the results of medical studies. The Cochrane Review reveals that the influence of pharmaceutical companies on medical research goes beyond just providing funding. The issue isn't just about conflicts of interest; it involves the way research is designed, conducted, and reported. And here are some of the key points that is from that article. Number one, hidden processes. Much of the corruption happens behind the scenes. Pharmaceutical companies often control every aspect of a study they sponsor, from design and organization to analysis and writing up of results. This is usually done by contract research organizations hired by the companies. Number two, ghost management. About 70 to 75 percent of industry spending on clinical trials goes to these contract research organizations rather than independent researchers. This means that even when it seems like academic or independent researchers are leading a study, the actual work is often done by these contracted organizations. Manuscripts are often drafted by ghost writers, creating a published. Record that is heavily influenced by pharmaceutical companies. Number three, manipulating study design. Companies can design studies in a way that are likely to produce favorable results. They make strategic choices about comparators, doses, populations, endpoints, trial durations, and definitions to increase the likelihood of positive outcomes. 
interpretation and writing bias also happens. And industry funding affects how data is interpreted and articles are written. And internal company documents show that they are aware of opportunities to spin results in a positive light. Number four, scientific misconduct. Sometimes the corruption goes as far as scientific misconduct, such as manipulating data or omitting adverse events. This can result in published conclusions that don't align with the actual trial data. Number five, publication biases. Trials with positive results are more likely to be published in medical journals, while those with negative results are often underrepresented. This can create a skewed perception in the medical literature, making certain treatments appear more effective than they actually are. And lastly, citation influence. Industry-funded trials are cited more frequently than non-industry trials. This could be because pharmaceutical companies actively promote their research using various resources, including influential speakers who present findings to physicians. A separate article was written by researchers from the University of Washington School of Medicine focused on how respiratory illness medication involves the high cost and uncertainty of benefits to patient outcomes. Now, the author stated many similar facts as the previous publication, such as publication biases of positive results, study design bias, and selective reporting of positive aspects of a treatment. On top of that, he also pointed out regulatory agencies often focus on non-inferiority compared to existing drugs when granting drug approvals. Next comes to the marketing schemes. Physicians are often too busy to read the studies, and they may be misled by statistically significant p-values that may not translate into clinical meaningful outcomes for patients. Now, many of the studies also uh, only offer short-term positive results, and physicians may be playing into drug companies' hands and neglecting the cost and long-term effectiveness when prescribing new drugs. At the end of the day, a significant portion of new drugs doesn't offer new mechanisms. They are essentially copies of existing drugs, and companies market them as superior, sometimes at a higher cost, even though the differences are often minimum in real life. Last but not least, the root cause is the regulatory agency itself. Back in the early 20th century, the FDA gained authority to protect consumers after scandals involving poor quality food and unsafe medications. One notable success was the FDA's refusal to approve thalidomide in the 1950s, preventing a major tragedy as the drug caused devastating birth defects elsewhere. Historically, the FDA was fully funded by taxpayers. This changed in the 1990s when the HIV AIDS epidemic heightened the need for quicker drug approvals. To expedite the process, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act was introduced, leading to a substantial portion of the FDA's budget coming from user fees paid by manufacturers seeking approval for drugs and devices. Now, user fees have expedited the FDA's drug approval process, resulting in quicker responses and more efficient communication between the FDA and manufacturers. We have seen this in recent emergency situations, such as during the pandemic, where the FDA rapidly authorized potential treatments. Now, the FDA also claims that collaboration has led to clearer guidance for manufacturers, improving transparency and understanding of regulatory expectations. The Prescription Drug User Fee Act also allowed the agency to hire more reviewers. In 1987, it took 29 months for the FDA to decide on a new drug application, whereas by 2018, it had decreased to just 10 months. Now, this acceleration has been accompanied by an increase in the percentage of standard new drug applications approved on the first attempt. 
Now, however, the reliance on user fees has raised concerns about the potential influence of industry stakeholders on the FDA. The fear is that corporate interests may compromise the agency's primary mission of safeguarding public health. Additionally, despite faster approval times, there has been a rise in the number of drugs facing serious safety issues after approval, potentially due to factors like senior FDA officials overturning scientists' recommendations and a lower burden of proof for approval. Now, most recently, in 2021, the FDA overturned its advisory committee's vote to reject Biogen's controversial Alzheimer's drug, and three advisors resigned due to this incident. Now, three years later, in January 2024, Biogen voluntarily withdrew its Alzheimer's drug. Now, what's disappointing is that this action was not a direct order from the FDA. The user fee also does not support other areas where the FDA needs to step in to protect consumers, like combating counterfeit drugs and overseeing dietary supplement contaminations. Now, these areas do not generate user fees, putting consumer protection at risk. The ongoing evaluation of the user fee system is necessary to address concerns and ensure the FDA's effectiveness. In conclusion, I believe some drugs are needed and have saved many people from deadly diseases in the past, such as tuberculosis. But we as a society are increasingly relying on drugs to maintain chronic conditions and treat diseases that are modifiable with lifestyle especially during the early stages of the disease, such as being overweight. Now, it is March 2024, and we have lived through a very rough time in the past four years. The aftermath continues. As a pharmacologist and pharmacist, I know too well what drugs can and cannot do for us. I firmly believe everyone should take as little medicine as possible. This is why I'm trying to build a community here with viewers who share the same values. If you're on board, like this video, leave me a comment, and I hope to see you again in my next one. Well, eat healthily and stay active. Take good care. Bye.